Welcome to the Integrated Schools Podcast. I'm Andrew, a white dad from Denver. And I'm Courtney, a white mom from L.A. And here we have episode two, The Borden Family. Courtney, I love this family. Yeah, the Bordens are the best people in the world. I am like so incredibly inspired by them. So they're a family who had attended a white privileged school for a while when their girls were really, really young. And then as they became aware of the segregation in their city, they made a choice for integration. And so now it's many years later and their daughters are in college and high school. So you'll be hearing today from the parents and the 10th grade daughter reflecting back on their experiences. Yeah, they're great. And what, what I really love about this episode is First, like just how genuinely good people the Bordens are. Um, right. But if it, it hits on so many of the themes that we hear um, at integrated schools and just to hear this sort of lovely family talking about how they did it wrong and then they got a second chance and they did it right. It's it's great. Yeah. And there's just so many just beautiful ways they have of of framing their understanding of this experience. It's it's wonderful. Anyway, we hope you love them as much as we do. Uh, let us know at Integrated Schools on Twitter, Integrated Schools on Facebook, or email us at hello at integratedschools.org. And don't forget to share the podcast, leave us a review, and subscribe. There's more great conversations coming. And now, on with the show. Welcome. I'm super glad the Borden family is here talking with us. Could I get you to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Jenny Borden. I am the mom of Olivia. I'm Olivia, and I'm a 10th grader right now. And my name's Scott Borden. I'm the father of Olivia and also um, her older sister, Summer, who can't be here today. She's away at college. And we're in Minneapolis. Well, Welcome. We got connected through you all because we were interested in talking with people who had kind of been in these integrating schools for a while and could kind of reflect back on that experience. So I guess, how did your sort of story start? How did you find yourselves at an integrating school? How did that work for you? So our kids were already in a school. It was a fairly affluent school overwhelmingly white school when our school district started to have a conversation with the community about school choice, school boundaries. And Scott and I went to a meeting where they put up um, some information that was a surprise to me. It shouldn't have been, but we have a choice system where you fill out cards and you put them in and then you get your choices. And they put up that like overwhelmingly white families and families of wealth, families that don't qualify for free and reduced lunch, put in their cards. After that, all the wealthy schools are, are full. And then the other 50% of kids, which is more of our black and brown students and our students who qualify for free and reduced lunch do not take part in that process. And then those students end up at the rest of the schools, I guess. And so that was really shocking to me and it shouldn't have been because I think that we were sending our kids to a school, like I said, that was, that was pretty much a a white and wealthy school. And we knew our city looked different from that. And we knew that our community looked different from that, but we didn't really ask questions of how that happens. And, and I think that's how privilege works. You kind of put up blinders and you don't ask questions. Um, You think it might seem not right, but the district's telling you, here's what you can do and here are what choices that you have. And so, so that's where we were our first round when our kids were were really little, Um, but we kind of got up this second choice. And here we had a school right down our street that we didn't look at during the school choice process. More than 90% of the kids were black and brown students. More than 90% of the kids qualified for free and reduced lunch. And during that kind of year of conversations and really looking and examining systemic racism, um, taking part in kind of what I came to believe was a racist system, how our individual choices um, matter, uh, we decided to switch our two daughters from that school to the school down the street. And so when we made that switch, our older daughter, who's in college now, was in fourth grade. It was a, it was a K-5 or a pre-K-5 school. And Olivia was in first grade. 
So I, I'm really curious when you were sort of doing your first round with Summer, why didn't you look at the school down the street? There was three schools that I felt like everybody looked at. So we looked at those schools and a few extras. And I'm sure that I said horrible things like nobody goes to that school down the street, which was a school full of, you know, there was like four or 500 kids at that school. Yeah, um, people did yeah. actually go to that school. Yes, exactly. And, and the, the school, it had a, you know, there's, it had a history in our, our, our neighborhood of people saying really bad things about it. I will say Scott, who's been silent, like he did say, why aren't we looking at Lindale? Why aren't we going to look at Lindale? And I was just like, you don't understand the process. And this is where, where the people look. And this is how they, and we're looking at six schools. And so that seems like enough. And so that's how we didn't look at Lindale, I think. And then it was sort of after Summer had been enrolled for a couple of years, that's when you said, maybe we need to look at Lindale. Like, Yeah, I mean, it was for me personally, it was really the district opening up the conversation because the district wasn't telling us to look at Lindale. You know, if you called placement and you were who we were, they wouldn't have directed us to that school. They would have directed us to schools that had higher concentrations of people that looked like me. And so yeah, for me, what was eye opening was an explicit conversation about the inequities in our district and the system that's creating them. That was, it couldn't deny the questions that I hadn't asked. Um, and I think we knew it was a conflict with our values. And what I mean by it was conflict in our, our values, like we lived in an integrated neighborhood. We believed in equity. We believed in making friends and knowing people across cultural, socioeconomic, racial lines. Um, and the connections among people was good. And then we were sending our kids to a school that didn't really reflect those things that we said we valued. And so probably sitting with that for a few years also helped me to be open to the conversation. Scott, I'm wondering how you felt after you transferred. Well, I, I remember when Olivia came home from school one day at first grade and, you know, we asked her how school was and she said that she really uh, loved it and that we should have sent her there in, in kindergarten. So, <laughs> so, you know, that, that, you know, as a parent, you want to hear that your child had a good day at school. So that made me happy. I, I would look back and say that it was a mistake to buy into the herd mentality so leaders in our neighborhood who had come before us had, had fought for this, what was come to be known as the three choice guarantee, which essentially gave people from our neighborhood, white parents, advantage uh, essentially to, to getting their children enrolled into um, three schools that were overwhelming majority of white students. And it was kind of just accepted that that's the way things were to be. Our oldest daughter really took off when she started school there. And I can't do her justice for her words, but she said something to the effect at her old school, there was kind of one way to be. And at her new school, Lindale, there were just so many different ways to be. And for her, I think it was a very freeing experience. Now, I just talked about all the stuff that was good for our family, but our initial decision was wrong. And the school district's uh, emphasis on individual family choice, se seemingly above everything else, it, it just, in my assessment, after learning more about the system as a whole, that our first choice wasn't supporting the overall good of public education, that it was actually had a net negative effect on it. And I think uh, switching to Lindale had a chance to maybe write that. When Scott was talking to you and he, what you said about the herd mentality, like I was thinking like, how, what was it like, you know, when we were first picking one in the summer and like all the folks at preschool, everybody that we talked to, it was like accepted and there wasn't really conversations about doing something different. And then when we did decide to switch our children 
there were people that were like, don't do this. And you're sacrificing your kid. And there was pushback. And, and for, was, for people who it didn't, you know, it's just our choice even. And it was beyond, I mean, it was beyond just neighbors. It was school district administration. It was at least one school board member. I mean, I remember a teacher saying you have to do everything to fight to not send your child to that school. <laughs> you know, the sad thing is, is that we never took the time to talk to the people that actually had sent their kids to Lindell because if you listen and talk to them. They loved it. So, Olivia, can I ask you if you feel sacrificed? That's just zero. No, not <laughs> even the slightest. No, not at all. You don't feel like your future has been compromised? No, oh, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> like, my education's going well. I have friends. I Nothing's really gone wrong. This idea of sacrifice, I think there's that, you know, that some parents maybe are concerned that what are they going to have to sacrifice if they send their child to a high poverty school or a school where there, there's few white kids. I, I feel like the high test scores and the, the, the five star ratings and I, I feel like in pursuing that or chasing that, I guess, whiteness like we end up sacrificing a lot. Um, the other thing we didn't say that over 50% of the students at, at Summer and Olivia School, when they switched, they were English as a second language uh, learners. A and a sizable number of the students' families were from Somalia. And so you add the issue of, of race and religion as well. So in, in a world where there were a lot of people that were fearful, my experience was, was very much a contrast to this. this is so, so much of the time is like in our city, we, we talk about, well, the parents aren't involved in the children's education, and that's what the problem is. And I thought, these parents, like, they're so involved in their children's education. They walk to school with their children every day, the eating breakfast with their children in the, in the lunchroom. And I just learned like so much as a father from just watching them and just yeah. being around them. Well, and I think the way we talk about people being involved in their school is, is a white way of being involved in our school. And I think our principal was really good about like, here's how parents are involved in just different ways of seeing parent involvement. It might not be having a big BTA that's raising a lot of money. Yeah, there, there's other ways that parents are involved. But I was thinking about what you were saying about fear, Scott, because from the time that we started the school, making friends with Somali people and Muslim people, we learned so much about Islam and, and, and just having friends that were Muslim when the fear started to really ramp up. And then I have, I have white friends that don't have a single Muslim friend. And so then they feel really afraid. And then you can just be like, no, they're like regular people that love America, <laughs> that go to the grocery store, that celebrate holidays with their children. It's so simple, right? But it, I fear when, when there is, there is probably a benefit for somebody to have people separate from each other and afraid of each other so that there's a, probably a lot of ways to have power um, with that fear. And I think like sending your kid to an integrated school a lot of people say we want to make friends across racial lines or ethnic lines or religious lines, but they don't know how to do it. It can be hard, like in our society, if you go to your wherever and then you just keep seeing people that look like you. But in a school, it's like the easiest, it's such an easy way to cross those boundaries. I mean, I don't want to, like, pat myself on the back, but, like, I never had to learn to, like, not be afraid of Muslim people. And I think that's, like, nice. In an ideal, like, world that, like, Minneapolis liberals say they want, where people are able to interact across racial and economic and 
religious lines, but you want 40 year olds to do it, but a five year old can't do it. Actually, a five year old can do it and your kid can do it. I think it's best to start having those connections and those crossings when you're young because everyone knows that it's easiest to learn when you're a kid. True. Olivia, you said that when you got to middle school, it kind of a a bunch of elementary schools fed in, some of them being much more global majority like yours and some being more homogenous or white privileged segregated schools. How do you think that your experience at Lindale helped you being 13 and or 12 in some giant building filled with other 12 year olds? There was an experience with English not being everyone's first language. I was in the sixth grade Minnesota studies class. There was like some kid, like the teacher asked him a question and like, it took him a little bit to like answer. And I remember there was kids laughing and I was like, what is wrong with you? Do you have no empathy or respect for anyone? Because the kid was taking a long time. Yeah, because he was just thinking about his answer and he didn't know right away. And I was like, is this like, are you kidding me? So then I talked to my teacher about it. She tried to create like an inclusive classroom and like it was a history class and we would always like talk about like justice and how like history repeats itself. She wanted to make us think and wanted to make us like care about like what's right, I would say. So I was like, this isn't okay. Like, I don't like the way they're acting. And then, so we had a whole lesson where one of the staff at the school, she just came and gave the lesson all in Somali. And then all the kids were like, like, we, we don't know what she's saying. And I was like, yeah, you only speak one language. And this kid speaks two languages and you're laughing at him for it. And I think that was something that I might've been the kid laughing if I didn't go to Lindale. That's a really good story. Olivia, another one of the things that um, you know, parents of four-year-olds who are thinking about where they're going to enroll their kids next year for kindergarten, one of the things that people talk about a lot is that they're worried that their kid won't be academically challenged. So I'm wondering what your experience was. And, okay. and, and I also want you to be really honest, Olivia. I will. I have few memories of kindergarten. Like, but I remember we would read on Friday and I hated Fridays because I just couldn't read and I just despised them so much because I would just have to like pick up a book and like fake read. So then I went to Lindale and we had this scale they use in elementary school with a reading level that's like A's to Z's. And so the first time I did my test, I got a B And then the next time I hopped up a ton of letters to like a G or something. So can I just interrupt you? Just to make the point clear, her privileged school, she came into her new school environment pretty much towards the bottom of the reading levels. I just couldn't, like, I couldn't read. The Lindale educated kindergarten is way ahead of of where Olivia was. And then (laughs) next time I could read. And... I think I was learning all the time. Like I never felt like I wasn't, but something that I was also doing there was not all the time, but like teaching. One thing, like when you're learning something, it's like, you don't understand. You kind of understand, you understand. And then the point beyond understanding is like, you understand it so well that you can teach it to someone else. And like, that's when you get to that point, like that's when you like, that's like the ultimate goal where, you know, you've really learned it. And I think sometimes like I could get there and then maybe I could like help my classmates, which is like the fullest extent of learning is being able to like teach someone else how to do it. And I don't know. I just don't really, right now I'm doing fine in school Like when I got to sixth grade, I never felt like I was so behind all the other kids. And even if that wasn't the case, especially the first years of elementary school, in my opinion, yes, you need to know how to add 
and I learned how to add and I learned how to do all this other stuff. So it wasn't an issue. But elementary school is about learning how to share, how to be nice, how to be empathetic and all of those things I learned. And I think learning those social skills at a young age is arguably more important. But it doesn't even matter if it was more important because I learned both. The teachers at Liddell like had this wide range of of kids that came in, including kids that, you know, from kids that didn't speak English at all. And so good teachers in an environment with this wide range of kids coming in, um, I think are the best that you will find. And so at our other school, there's probably a more narrow range of what kids were coming in. So, you know, sometimes you can shoot to the middle and look pretty good, but this was, you know, truly people that were really good at differentiating um, instruction. But the other thing, when we switched our kids, like I didn't know what was going to happen and I wasn't, you know, I was also fearful, <laughs> like, is it going to, are they going to learn? Is it going to be okay? Is there, and I remember coming to the, like the open house and just realizing like, even though there were, at the time, I, the school was fewer than 10% kids were white. We walk into the open house and just, you carry privilege with you everywhere. And, you know, like I talked to the teacher for not very long and you realize you have all these things in common. That wasn't a, a real, I bet I, you know, now it seems like, of course, but at the time that was a real realization for me. And another realization during their schooling time was I did not think that I was a parent that taught my student, my kids, like we didn't do anything extra around learning that what I, that what I perceived as parents that are worried about their kids learning, they have workbooks or they do math facts or, or whatever, but just realizing what a luxury it is for our kids to have like two parents that went to college, they come home, they might be doing an assignment, they get a little stuck, you can walk by in an 15 seconds, they're unstuck and they can keep going with their assignment. And just to have those resources for you every, they follow you around wherever you go. I really, you know, we really fell in love with this particular school, Lindale. Um, but there was a time that I realized oh, we could send our kids to any school um, and, and they're going to get a good education. Well, no, I, I just like to maybe piggyback on this. I think that kids, white kids or kids from families that with history of education or formal education, and I guess that, that that is an advantage. As parents, like when we demand through advocacy that our school district maintain these overwhelming majority white students that that maybe cater to, to white families and then expect the black and brown families to be the ones that integrate schools like I think it's it seems like we're wasting resources or taking a greater share of the public dollars. It does feel tricky though because yeah. it is like it's hard to say that I think that my daughters could go to any school in MPS and they would do well. And at the same time, there's a lot of kids going to schools in MPS and they are not doing well. And so that that's where my struggle is. Yeah, I think overall, I think what we're trying to say is in Minneapolis, there's this huge racial disparity between white kids in school and kids of color in school, between how they're doing. And sometimes it's called the achievement gap or sometimes it's called the opportunity gap because it really is a lot about people's opportunities. Yeah. But overall, this gap, having our segregated schools is really just making it worse and worse. And I think and integrating schools is like a big part of closing it. It's hard to find this out, I think, for parents when they're looking at, at, at schools. I mean, I know that parents love their children and they want what's best for their children. And, 
in Minneapolis in particular, I think there's a lot of white parents that believe their children are really advanced. Or <laughs> it's not just or, Minneapolis. There's a white exceptionalism, right? Like that our children are like the most unique. The, the, the truth of the matter is, I think, is a lot more kids are just middle of the road. And I, I think what really helps a range of students is high expectations for all students. Olivia, your mom told me when we talked the other day, that you had a lot to say to the adults who were in charge of these situations. <laughs> there's all these problems created by adults. <laughs> and then there's so much weight on kids to fix them. And then we try to fix them and we come up with solutions or ideas. And then it's kind of just like, no, because, and they won't do anything about it. But then when we try to do something about it, just like, this is just a very like general thing, but then, but then we're just ignored, which can be frustrating. Can you give me one example? What's tiring right now is the high school that I go to, like it's considered integrated. It's considered diverse. But, like, the sad thing is, like, my education since Lindale, I feel like it's just gotten worse because now I go to this integrated school and, like, in the halls, I see all sorts of kids. But in my classes, it's just white kids because it's advanced classes. And it's, like, who's who's pushed to sign up? And, like, when someone's, like, on the edge between choosing AP U.S. history and regular U.S. history, who is encouraged to do advanced and who's encouraged to do regular. It's just really frustrating to be in this school. Everyone is like, oh, like, it's like, it's diverse. Like, we're proud of ourselves. And then the classes just don't reflect that. And that problem, it seems like everyone's just kind of settled with it. And it's just like, well, like, this sucks. We're just not going to do anything. Like, that's the way it is. And that can be really frustrating. What would you, with your magic Olivia wand, what would you do? Well, there's, like, a few things. I think some, like, advanced classes, there could just be, like, everyone takes it. Because the curriculum of, like, the regular class and the advanced class isn't that different. But I also think, like, starting in middle school, you just need to, like, tell kids you can, like, you can do it. And, like, but you gotta, I don't know, I feel like we need to help kids into the idea that, like, you, like, you can do it. You're smart enough to do it. What makes someone else smarter than you? And just, like, the fact that, like, you don't have to take every single advanced class but like maybe you can just take this one because that's something you're good at. There needs to be more support. I mean, like we're kind of understaffed, so that's hard, but like support for kids going from eighth grade into ninth grade and like choosing what classes they're going to take because not everyone has parents telling them, oh, you need to take this class, this class, and this class because colleges will like it. Like not everyone has that kind of support, which is why there needs to be a lot more support coming from the school. Yeah, and the thing that you said too is like sometimes it's hard to see what the big differences are in the curriculum. And so then that makes you wonder why is there an advanced class and a regular class yeah. for this particular one? And she, Olivia said to me recently something like, you know, what it, what is the school teaching me by sending me to a all white class? Yeah. I think that's something, you know, to consider. You, you don't just learn the content of your classes, but yeah. how how the whole structure of the, how they're made and how they happen. And then if I'm having a discussion in history or English or whatever, and everyone has the same background and the same opinion, and you're just hearing the same things like, I agree, I agree, I agree. <laughs> how is that a good discussion? How, how do you learn from that? You know, Olivia, I would love to know if there were any any challenges. I think you've talked a lot about the value and um, and and how this has been a good experience for you. Were there ever times that like your whiteness became I mean, hard? Okay, 
I'm just going to start out by saying, like, it was a while ago. So I want that to just be known. I mean, I'm sure there were days that weren't good, but I just can't remember them. But at the same time, I think I had to learn a lot. And I guess you could see that as a challenge, but I just don't see it as a challenge. I did like met all these new kids and learned like a lot of stuff about like their lives. And I don't know, I just don't think that like learning and the new experience was like ever like really hard. And they were no no kid was ever like to me, oh look, Olivia, she's so pasty. <laughs> like that was like I was they weren't like mean or no one was like excluding me. Like I mean there were like individual things that happened when she was in elementary school that were hard. No. Um, and like, like we said, one of the, like when she was in second grade, there was a boy that was writing her <laughs> these notes that were inappropriate. And they, can I say, like called you sexy and she really <laughs> hated it, but neither one of us credit race or ethnicity or religion. Yeah. It just seemed to me to our family to be a thing that would have happened in any school. And so yeah. that we can't. We can't really cite that yeah. as the as an issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we did have perspective of being at another school. Yeah. There was like a rampant lice epidemic, <laughs> <laughs> and in, at, in yeah, which school? At, at, at your first school. At my first. School, yeah. yeah, and then and then and there were other things. There were boring worksheets, and there was bullying kids, and just the what things happen in elementary school in the first in the first school. Okay, I mean, in our first, we'd already seen all that. So there was like a teacher that didn't have control of the classroom and the kids were running wild, you know, all those things. And so then switching to this school, we had some perspective. And so that I think that's part of why it's harder for us to identify things that were particular to be sending your kid to a global majority school or high poverty school, except for white families, the standard that they hold those schools to is much higher. And so, you know, a lice epidemic probably wouldn't fly for some families that maybe tried it and then they would be out the door or you get some boring worksheets, which we already knew there were boring worksheets, you know, yeah. but you get some boring worksheets and they think, oh, it's because there's poor kids and we have to teach them where we're, with worksheets. Or you get a kid who's kind of inappropriate and think, yeah. oh, it's because there's, you know, these children aren't yeah. raised right or whatever. And, and I think our perspective, Perspective was more like, yeah, we we know all these things actually yeah, happen, like, and where the way you know we don't blame these affluent schools for those problems, as I don't think we should, like they, you know, but we also should not blame these high poverty yeah. schools for a lot of the things yeah. that just actually happen with elementary yeah. school. The truth is, we're just kids, like, and kids can be like kind of crazy but like <laughs> those problems or I think any problem I faced I think I would have like encountered at any a version of any, it yeah a yeah. version of it at any elementary school because that's just like how elementary school is and there's like I don't I don't really think I like faced any big challenges that solely came from going to an integrated school and it does, you know, these differences exist and being in an integrated environment, you just talk about them all the time, you know? And I think that that's good. Like, I don't think we really talked about race much or say black people or white people or brown people. Like it's all been learning for me and not comfortable, you know, as a white person, you don't grow up talking about race. You have to kind of pretend like it doesn't exist even, you know, when it, does you know and even if it's a it is a construct right but it it has weight in our society we make it matter so I think the conversations that come out of the hard situations are valuable and give you you know give you kind of a lot of perspective too mm -hmm. on you know in this particular case you know just on wealth and poverty yeah.
I, I just want to give you the opportunity to, if you want to say any last thing before we kind of turn off the recorder, um, things you would want parents who are thinking about this to know or stories that this conversation has made you think about. You know, everybody, especially with your first child, the first child you're sending off to kindergarten, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, emotions and it's hard to think about the long term. And what I've kind of really learned from this is listening to Summer's classmates and, and, and Olivia's classmates, especially when they were in elementary school, but as the, as they've grown too, is that I'm, I'm tremendously hopeful for, for the future of our city and the world. When parents are making decisions about school, they they maybe look back on their school experience and what it was like for, and if it was positive, they want want something similar for their children. And and I kind of think it's important to look to the future when making that school decision. You know, we, we often do things as parents were in self-interest, and I, I just think it, it's, not, it's not the only way, and it's not a guarantee that there's going to be learning, but I, I think integrated schools su- support our democracy and support education and our uh, economy. So I would just encourage parents to, to look for the future, to, to what kind of world they want their children to, to live in as they grow and when they become adults. And I think if you believe in these things about integration and diversity and black families and brown families, it's been on their backs. They're the ones that have had to take on these challenges to do things that aren't always easy. And these children are are resilient. I, I just think it's on white families to whether it's hard or easy that if integration is important to you, you got to take the action. And, and, you know, this isn't 1950. It's not 1990 where the changing demographics of our, our cities and our nations, it, it, people got to get comfortable. <laughs> okay. I run. And what my coach always says about running, but he says, you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable and I think that can just be applied to almost like every situation (laughs) like you gotta get comfortable being uncomfortable and like get used to it because one one day you're not gonna be uncomfortable and you're just gonna be thriving yeah and I was thinking like this is the world that's changing and this is like the great opportunity especially if it's time to pick your kid's school, that is a great opportunity. You, you should seize it and get with the, 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 the world the way it is. And also your kid's probably pretty cool. And they're smarter and stronger and kinder than you think. And they're, they're going to be fine. Like, <laughs> I don't know the last time you've talked to a five-year-old, but like they have some of the best things to say. And great perspectives. So, like, all the fears that are in you, in parents' hearts, their kids just haven't learned those those fears yet. So maybe they don't, like, ever have to. And they can just learn to just, like, love everyone. And, like, they don't have to... They can they, learn not to be fearful. To yeah. Embrace difference and change and change what I love about what you all have said in different ways is your kids actually like cooler and you know more resilient but also not that special <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, love, I love that like both of those things actually matter here I, I don't know schools and kids just become invisible for overwhelming majority of of black children I, I think it just becomes invisible to white people if you want to say there's a white dominant culture like if kids are invisible to a a segment of that society it's like the goodness and human spirit in those children and the resiliency in those children is just not seen and then when there's a problem then all of a sudden they're seen and like the spotlights are on it i just think that it's not a good way to see other people and it's not a good way to be seen. So I don't know. It just, it just seems if you believe in integration, 
it just seems like to allow that to continue, it, it just seems wrong. Oh my God, Andrew, how great are they? I know. Did you hear the cows in the background? I love it. It's so good. <laughs> it's better than the trash truck background at my house. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah or your or your crows. <laughs> That's right. Oh my gosh. But Andrew, when Olivia was telling the story about the classmate who was struggling a little with his English and all mm. the other kids who were laughing at him, and that was just so powerful. And she said something like, if I hadn't gone to this integrating school that I did, I might have been the one laughing. Damn. Damn. Mm. Yeah. And then Scott, the dad, getting teary about learning so much from parenting from the families at his school. It's like they did the whole family. They just give me hope. Yeah. If Olivia is going to be the one in charge in the future, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And Jenny, the mom, I am just so incredibly moved by her. I wish I was her. I wish, I hope my kids end up being her. She's just yeah. so, she's just so wonderful. And I think what's fascinating about this to me is, is, you know, kind of like as we're expanding to think about how we, you know, like how this applies to integrated schools in general is, is just that she didn't know right? Like she was so deep in the kind of typical white narrative around schools and choice, and then was really able to hear and grapple with the issue of segregation when it was presented to her. I just feel like so many people don't really know. And it was what, like 8% of people who participated in protests in the South during the civil rights era. What if, what if we had 8% of the Jennies out there? It could be a movement. (laughs) Right. Let's hope for it. Yep. <laughs> we hope you all enjoyed hearing from them as much as we did. Uh, let us know what you thought at Integrated Schools on Twitter, Integrated Schools on Facebook. Email us hello at integratedschools.org. We really would love to hear from you. And subscribe. Episode three is coming up and it is great. It's a conversation with uh, author Maggie Hagerman about her new book called White Kids Growing Up with Rural Privilege in a Racially Divided America. Yes, yes. I'm really, really, really excited for that one. Huge thanks to the Bordens for sharing their story, just for being all around awesome. And thanks as always to Kevin Casey for our music. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, the Bordens. Thank you, Andrew. See you guys next time. Bye.